So uh, this session was taken by me on uh, almost uh, two weeks back, and uh, it was basically uh, an introduct kind of introduction to vascular anatomy for uh, radiation oncologists because you, all of you know that a lot of our contouring guidelines are now actually based on vessels, muscles, nerves, and many other things. So it is important for all of us to have some kind of basic idea at least so that we can understand and identify the structures. Uh, before I actually proceed, uh, let us greet all again that is the uh, 74th Happy Independence Day and uh, as a proud Indian, we should all celebrate. And after this session, actually I am having a small informal uh, Independence Day celebration on a Zoom meeting with my uh, school friends and uh, my medical college friends. So I'll be uh, quick in my uh, talk. So uh, I do not have any conflict of interest, neither do I have any source of funding. And definitely I am a radiation oncologist, not a radiologist. And whatever I'll speak today will be kind of practical tips rather than detailed radiological discussion. I am not a suitable person to do, uh, to do a radiological discussion. So this will start with a, a small discussion about vascular anatomy of thorax and then it will be followed by abdomen and pelvis. Before we start, whatever vascular anatomy we discuss, we should have some basic idea about the cardiac chambers. So you can all see that uh, this is a very basic schematic representation of the heart. This is the right ventricle. Uh, it's connected with the right atrium, the left ventricle, the left atrium. From the right ventricle, we can see that the pulmonary trunk is arising. It's again dividing into left and right pulmonary artery. From the left ventricle, this is the aorta arising. The ascending aorta, arch of aorta, then it goes back to become the, uh, the descending thoracic aorta. Then it continues as abdominal aorta. And in between, uh, it gives a couple of branches we'll discuss. In the right atrium, we can see that the superior vena cava is uh, draining from the upper part of the body and inferior vena cava is draining from the lower part of the body. And within the left atrium, we can see a couple of pulmonary veins, superior and inferior pulmonary veins are, uh, are draining from left and right sides. And this is a enlarged zoom view of the arch of aorta. We can see that the right at the beginning of the aorta, the, the right and left coronary artery begins, the ascending aorta giving the branch, three branches, the, the brachiocephalic artery, which again divides into right and uh, right subclavian artery and right common carotid artery, the left common carotid artery and left subclavian artery. We should remember that there is no left brachiocephalic artery. However, if you see the, uh, the other schematic diagram, <coughs> this is the brachiocephalic right brachiocephalic, the left brachiocephalic, they unite together to form the superior vena cava and internal jugular vein and subclavian vein. So both sides, the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein, they unite together to form the left brachiocephalic vein and both brachiocephalic veins join together to form the superior vena cava which drains into the right atrium. Now, uh, if we see there is no corresponding left brachiocephalic artery. So the common carotid artery, left common carotid artery and left subclavian artery so they are the direct continuation of the arch of aorta. So this much basics we need to know and also we need to see that this uh, the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus and the association with the pulmonary artery. Now another schematic diagram to show in, in short the major arteries and their branches the thoracic aorta continuing as abdominal aorta. These are the unpaired arteries and the paired arteries. You can see this in detail later on. And the schematic representation of the veins, how do they form inside the pelvis and inside the abdomen, they continue. So we'll, mostly we know from this, the external and internal iliac veins and arteries. So the, they form the common iliac vein. They again unite to form the inferior vena cava and ultimately it drains in the right atrium in between a lot of other veins like renal vein, like the adrenal, the phrenic, the hepatic, gonadal and lumbar veins, they unite. The left renal vein crosses the midline and goes to the right side to unite with the inferior vena cava. So 
Uh, in nutshell, this is how we contour the cardiac chambers, and this is basically amalgamation of a couple of uh, recently published articles. So when we contour the, the contour the heart, we contour the entire heart with its pericardium, and superiorly we contour it at the lower border of pulmonary trunk where it crosses the midline. So we need to under, uh, need to understand how the pericardium looks. We need to understand the pulmonary trunk where it is crossing the midline. Inferiorly, the heart blends with the diaphragm. We contour the entire pericardial sac, and we have to be very careful not to include left lobe of liver, which sometimes becomes very confusing. We, uh, so uh, this is the entire heart, and then we need to contour the chambers. If we contour the left ventricle, we have to contour it from the mitral valve and going down till the apex. Medially, we contour with almost one centimeter of the septal wall and it fuses with the right ventricular wall. Then <clears throat> our major area or major um, uh, normal structures here of interest would be the left coronary artery, the right coronary artery, the left circumflex artery and left anterior descending artery. So the, when the arch of aorta or from the, when the ascending aorta begins from the left ventricle, there are aortic dilatations or sinuses. And from the left and right side, this left coronary artery and right coronary artery uh, emerges. The first left branch from the aorta is left coronary artery and the right first right branch from the right side of the aorta is the right coronary artery. And we will see that the left, uh, the left coronary artery will divide into left anterior descending and left circumflex artery. The left anterior descending artery will run in between the interventricular groove anteriorly and the left circumflex artery will run into the groove between the left ventricle and the left, uh, left atria. The right coronary artery will uh, run uh, behind and, uh, and kind of wrap around the heart and will ultimately continue as the right interventricular uh, artery. That will run through the posterior aspect of the heart but as of now we really do not give too much importance to right, right coronary arteries. This is how it looks like on a <clears throat> contrast CT scan. We can see the dilated left atrium and these are the, these are the pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. Now, when I, when I see only one cross section, it will be difficult for me to understand whether this is superior pulmonary vein or inferior pulmonary vein. So I have to scroll up and scroll down to understand. So this is the aorta. We can see the ascending aorta, the sinus, and then we can see that the left coronary artery or left main coronary artery is originating. It's again dividing into left anterior descending at will, and also it will divide into left circumflex artery. And also uh, we can see the four chambers, the right ventricle, the interventricular septum, the left ventricle, the left atria, and we can also see the right atria. And we can see here the right coronary artery, which basically arises from the right side of the ascending aorta. We can see here. So this is the right coronary artery. We can see here the right atrium and it will have actually it will run in between the groove of right ventricle and right atria and it will wrap around posteriorly and will continue as posterior descending uh, artery and anteriorly we will see the anterior descending artery so uh, in my last talk someone asked me about what is thoracic inlet so i felt that uh, i should add uh, another slide so thoracic inlet is basically uh, an imaginary junction of the tissues of neck and the beginning of thoracic content. So it's not a clear-cut anatomical structure, it's, a, as it's an imaginary junction. And the junction is actually formed uh, by the soft tissue of neck or root of neck, of neck and the contents of, uh, of, of the thorax. It's basically a transverse plane which runs, through, uh, runs above the first rib and it's kind of basically a tilted imaginary line because we know that the ribs are a little bit uh, in a caudal limit compared to the posterior aspect. So anteriorly, the, uh, the thoracic inlet will be at a, lower, uh, at a lower level compared to the posterior aspect. So the posterior aspect of thoracic inlet will be a little bit higher up. Now, uh, going to the vascular anatomy again, uh, I always say that please remember this typical look the four dots in the midast in the in the anterior mediastinum so now we are within the thorax we have seen how the neck vessels are combining with each other and they are being uh, 
converted into major thoracic vessels. Now we are actually within the thorax and we can see these four dots in the same plane. The right most will be the right brachiocephalic vein. So please look at this schematic diagram. The right most will be the right brachiocephalic vein. So one dot is this one. The second dot, this one. This is the, <coughs> uh, the brachiocephalic artery. The third one, that would be the left common carotid artery, which is this one. And the fourth one will be left subclavian artery, which is this one. Now, you might question then what is this? So, this is basically the left brachiocephalic vein. So, this remains, so this is anterior structure and these are all posterior structure. So, actually, the brachiocephalic vein will be in a much more anterior location. So, we can see here, this one, I have not marked this. This is a horizontally running, horizontal structure which comes from the left side, crosses the midline, goes to the opposite side, unites with the right brachiocephalic vein. So, these four dots are these four major vessels, right brachiocephalic vein, then followed by right brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. You also need to identify the uh, trachea. This is the air-filled surplus structure. And on left of this, we can see one small muscular ring-like structure having air inside this. So this is the esophagus. And subsequently, you will see that identifying esophagus sometimes may be difficult. Now, <clears throat> this is the right brachiocephalic vein as I was showing you. And now we can see that the arch of aorta is visible here. In front of the arch of aorta, you can see the left brachiocephalic vein. So, I am going back to the previous slide. This is the left brachiocephalic vein which I was showing you. And you can see that the esophagus is lying down in the triangle between the circular ring-like trachea, the arch of aorta, the vertebral body. So, that is how we identify the structures. Now, uh, if we uh, go a little bit down, at the lower, a uh, little bit caudal aspect of the arch of aorta, we can also see the internal mammary artery, which arises from the subclavian artery and it lies at the back end or posterior to the uh, sternoclavicular junction. So, this is the sternum, this is the clavicle. Gradually, we will see that this internal mammary artery will come here. So, this is almost at the level of the origin, which uh, where it ar arises from the subclavian artery. We can also see here the brachios, right brachiocephalic artery and we can also see that the left brachiocephal, sorry, brachiocephalic vein and we can also see that the left brachiocephalic vein is crossing the midline and going to the opposite side. Now, here we can again see that the esophagus is lying in between the trachea, the arch of, iso, uh, arch of aorta and the vertebral body. Now, a uh, couple of other important structures which I have shown here is the pectoralis minor muscle and the pectoralis major muscle and the lateral, lateral thoracic artery. Now, the reason to show these muscles in a lecture of a vessel is important because the idea of these classes were to have to give you a, uh, an idea about how to delineate the structures and the vessels and muscles here are important to delineate the nodal stations for breast cancers. So, we need to identify this pectoralis muscle also and we also need to identify pectoralis major which is a very thick and broad white uh, uh, muscles, um, white muscle which, which is the anterior most muscle of the thorax and right behind that is the pectoralis minor muscle, a relatively smaller and oval shaped muscle and you can see the lateral thoracic artery lying posterior and lateral to this pectoralis minor. So, this should be your landmark that the artery arising from the second part of axillary artery which is lying lateral and posterior to the pectoralis minor that would be lateral thoracic artery. So the importance of this, uh, you, you must have uh, by this time known that this guides us uh, when we delineate the breast parent cam or breast CTV, this forms the lateral most aspect of the breast CTV. Now, uh, we can also see here the serratus anterior muscle. We can also see here the subcapsularis muscle which lies underneath the, uh, the scapular wing. We can also see here the supraspinatus muscle and we will see that this is the latissimus dorsi muscle. So, identifying this latissimus dorsi muscle is important to form this imaginary line between this pectoralis major and that will be the anterior and lateral boundary for the level 1 lymph node in case of axillary radiation. Now, this 
The importance of this lateral thoracic artery is it lies posterior to the pectoralis muscle. So please remember this one. Now uh, we can see in this section that this left brachiocephalic vein is almost draining the almost uniting with the right brachiocephalic vein and we will see in the next section a couple of slices that it has actually formed the superior vena cava. Now he, this is the uh, this is the section this is the uh, area where they unite together. We can see here that the internal thoracic artery or the internal mammary uh, internal mammary artery that is almost at the back or at the posterior part aspect of the clavicular head gradually it will come forward. Now here we can see that the superior vena cava is almost formed by this time. The right brachiocephalic vein is still visible and we can also see part of the left brachiocephalic vein here. Arch of Havertonov we can identify here as going to be divided into uh, two different limbs. So if we remember the the origin of aorta, the ascending aorta, it arises, it goes upward, backward, and it also goes a little bit laterally, and then it again uh, comes to the uh, lateral aspect of the vertebral body, and that forms the descending thoracic aorta. So, at some CT slices, we will see two circular structures which would form the ascending and descending thoracic aorta. And at the top of that, we will see that arch of aorta is there. Now, here you can see beside this. In the anterior medial sternum, you can see this fat, uh, the fat space, which is the place for location of prevascular lymph node. Also, you can see here the azygous vein, which is a circular dot-like structure lying almost to the almost lateral to the uh, right side of the uh, trachea. And we can also see that after some more slices, it will drain the superior vena cava. The importance of which I'll discuss later on. <coughs> Sorry. So now we can see that the superior vena cava has been formed. Now we can see the ascending aorta and descending aorta as an individual structures. And when we see that the beginning that the arch of aorta is completely separated out, that will be the level where the autopulmonary window will begin. So the autopulmonary window is a potential space between the arch of aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So the upper border will be the lower border of arch of aorta. So where the arch of aorta will end, that would be the cranial most part of the outer pulmonary window. And where the pulmonary trunk will appear, will, that will be the caudal most part of the outer pulmonary window. And we can see here that the azygous vein is almost about to drain the superior vena cava. We can see here that the trachea is now going to be divided. So that will form the carina. And now we can see that the carina has been formed. Left and right main bronchus is now visible. We can see here an ascending aorta anterior to the carina as a completely different structure. And we can also see the descending thoracic aorta lying anterior and lateral to the vertebral, vertebral body. And this potential space is the, uh, is the outer pulmonary window and we can see the prevascular lymph nodal region. Now, uh, here we can see that the azygous vein was draining and now we can see azygous vein uh, is a completely different structure, is a dot-like structure lying posterior to the right main bronchus. So we can see the right main bronchus, we can see the left main bronchus and the dot-like circular structure behind the right main bronchus is the azygous vein. So azygous vein is basically a vascular, vascular system uh, which connects the IVC and superior vena cava. So we know from our basic medicine teaching that when there is a blockage that forms the collateral channels. So the azygous vein runs posterior to the right main bronchus and encircles sits on top of that and then goes to unite with the, to drain into the superior vena cava. Here we can see that esophagus is a compressed structure behind the left main bronchus. So at the level of carina and below that, the esophagus will be behind the left main bronchus. Sometimes because of the peristaltic movement, the esophagus remains collapsed and it may not be visible as a complete circular air filled structure. It will be just like a structure like this. And from this anatomical landmark, we have to identify when we contour esophagus as an OAR. So this space between the left main bronchus 
the the vertebral body and the descending thoracic aorta so that space will come to the uh, will consist of the esophagus and here we can now see that the descending thoracic aorta and ascending thoracic aorta are quite uh, wide apart and we can see the appearance of the left pulmonary artery and this is the pulmonary trunk if you can go a little bit above so the pulmonary trunk was not present here here we can see that the pulmonary trunk has appeared and this is the left pulmonary artery in a couple of more slices we will see that the right pulmonary artery is crossing the midline and going to the opposite side so this will be the lowermost part of the ap window and <clears throat> Now, uh, going a little bit more caudally, we can now see the precarinal, uh, the precarinal and the subcarinal lymph nodes. So the precarinal node is a that space or precarinal space is a potential space in front of the carina, and uh, the subcarinal space is potential space below the carina. Fortunately, here we can see two lymph nodes: one in the subcarinal region and one in the precarinal region, and. We can see here that the esophagus is again is a very collapsed structure, but we can appreciate the air in between this. We can also see the azygous vein lying anterior and lateral to the vertebral body and behind the right bronchus. Now, uh, <clears throat> here we can see the main pulmonary trunk. We can also see the left pulmonary artery, and we can see the faint appearance of the right pulmonary artery. So now, if we now, now uh, if we imagine. The left pulmonary artery was appearing in a little bit cranial level. So this is the cranial section. I am going one or two sections below. Now we can see appearance of the right pulmonary artery. So cranially, so uh, so, so so cranially, left pulmonary artery is more cranial, and the right pulmonary artery will be a little bit caudal. Now you can see the formation of right pulmonary artery completely, and now it is going almost to the midline. And in the next slice, it would cross the midline and go to the opposite side. And here we can see that the right main bronchus is now dividing into the lower or segmental bronchus. We can still appreciate here the azygous vein. We can still appreciate the subcarinal lymph node. We can see the superior vena cava, and we can also see here the left pulmonary artery. And we can see the esophagus again very clearly. So as I was saying that the right pulmonary artery appears on caudal section compared to the left pulmonary artery and the main pulmonary artery or main pulmonary trunk. Now that is how the carina divides and it goes to both sides of the lungs. So the trachea divides into in the carina it divides into left and right main bronchus. The left main bronchus divides into two lower bronchus and the right divides into three lower bronchus bronchus because they have this is having three lobes and this is having two lobes. They are also known as segmental bronchus. Now going back again to the vessel, the main pulmonary artery now crosses midline and goes to the opposite side. Now you can see that this is the right pulmonary artery crossing the midline and going towards opposite side. Now the importance of this when we contour heart as a as an OAR, this forms the so the section below this actually forms the uppermost or cranial most part of the heart as an OAR. We can see here the esophagus. You can also see the contrast filled azygous vein. Here we can also see the superior vena cava. We can also see the ascending aorta. We can see the main pulmonary trunk as an almost rounded structure. We can also see the left hilar vessels. However, as of now, we do not put much importance on the left hilar vessels. So the latissimus dorsi muscle is marked here. You can see, and as I was saying, that the anterior border of this muscle forms the basis of contouring the level one axillary lymph node. Now, gradually going down, we can see that the left atrium is appearing, and the moment we see that left atrium is appearing, we will also be able to see a couple of horizontal uh, spoke-like structures entering the left atrium. So from left side. And also from right, right side, we will we'll be able to see that. So they are basically pulmonary veins. And if we remember our basic no, basic teaching, the pulmonary veins they come they basically drain the lung and they enter the left atrium, and then they enter the left ventricle. So we can see here the left atrium. We can see the ascending outer root. We can also see the right ventricular outflow tract. 
and we can also appreciate the pulmonary veins. Now, these pulmonary veins are typically two to four in number. The superior and inferior, they will be two to four in number. They will be uh, coming from both sides. The numbers are variable and sometimes it can be two, it can be four. Now, the left, the right pulmonary artery, which was coming from the left side, crossing the midline. Now, we can see the right pulmonary artery is has been divided into a lower branch. And we can also see the superior vena cava in between this lower branch of right pulmonary artery and the aorta. Going down a little bit lower uh, section, we can now see the left atria more clearly and we can also see the uh, pulmonary veins. So this is the inferior pulmonary vein and we can also appreciate on the right side the inferior pulmonary veins. So looking at only one section or one slice of the city, it will be impossible to say whether this is inferior or superior because we need to know the relationship, the training order relationship. So scrolling up and scrolling down would help us identify the superior and inferior pulmonary veins. Now we can appreciate the esophagus here as a very thin compressed structure behind the left atrium and in between the left atrium and anterior vertebral body. Again, we can see the inferior pulmonary veins. We can also see the esophagus and we can also see the inferior pulmonary vein on the right side. We can see the superior vena cava, we can see the aortic root and we can also see the right ventricular outflow tract. Now, this is a typical look of the four chambers of the heart. This is important to understand because whenever there is an ambiguity to identify a structure, we should go back to this, this section where we can appreciate all the four chambers the left ventricle, right ventricle, the right atrium and left atrium. The moment we are able to identify these four chambers, we will be able to identify the subsequent structure. So we can just scroll up and down and we can track the left ventricle. We will be able to appreciate the origin of ascending aorta and subsequently we will be able to identify all the necessary vessels as well. And we can also see the esophagus here. So I have uh, marked this perforator, so this is important to uh, know that these perforators are basically branches of the internal mammary artery and they kind of form the medial boundary for the, uh, they basically supply the medial part of the breast and form the medial part of the boundary when we contour the breast as CTV. Now here uh, we have, I have used some kind of color coding, the colors are actually matching with the structure, so you can see the pulmonary trunk the cyan color and the pink color is the right pulmonary artery. The ascending and descending limbs of the thoracic aorta you can see gradually going down. You can also see the top of the left atrium we can see here and we can see that the pulmonary veins are actually draining within the left atrium. Now here we can see appearance of the left main coronary artery so the aorta the first branch coming out from the left side of the aorta is the left main coronary artery and now we will be seeing that this left coronary artery is divided into the left anterior descending and left circumflex artery. Uh, I'm sorry for this little bit mismatch of the, uh, the indicators. So this is the left anterior descending and this is the left circumflex artery. Now. <clears throat> We can very well see the aortic semilunar valve leaflets very clearly. It all depends on the kind of imaging you have used. Not every time we can appreciate this so, uh, so well. We can also see the left atrium draining into the left ventricle. So this is the left atrium, left ventricle, the, and we can appreciate the origin of the outer the aortic root. So this is a caudal section. The moment we go upwards, we can appreciate the out actually. So I am going down again. Now we can see the left ventricular wall, we can see the interventricular septum and we can also see the papillary muscles which are projecting and uh, <clears throat> so we can see the left ventricle in pink color. So this includes the interventricular septum and you can see the papillary wall muscles. This color is papillary muscle, this is the papillary muscle and this is being, uh, this has been done to help identify that uh, that the papillary muscles are attached to the mitral valve leaflets. Now gradually we will be seeing that the uh, right ventricle, this is the left ventricle and we will be able to appreciate the pericardial sac now. This is very clear in this image. However, sometimes we do not really see this much clear pericardial sac and 
Uh, when we contour the heart, we contour this entire peri this heart, including this entire pericardial sac. And gradually, when we contour the left anterior descending artery, you can see that it's coming till the tip of the left ventricle or the apex of the left ventricle. Sometimes what happens because of the differences in uh, acquiring of images and the quality of images, we may not be able to see this. So it's important that you identify wherever you are able to do and then you can possibly interpolate them to have an idea. Now, once we are uh, the thoracic aorta, descending thoracic aorta pierces the diaphragm and continues as the abdominal aorta, we can see this kind of images. So here we can see that the abdominal aorta, the thoracic aorta has now pierced the diaphragm and it has become the, the abdominal aorta. And the other structures, what we can see here is the liver. We can also see the IVC. This is faint little bit. And in between IVC and the aorta, we can see the esophagus. We can also appreciate two circular dot-like structures on both sides of the aorta. So this is the right. So this is the, the right side is the azygous vein, and the left side is the hemiazygous vein. We can also appreciate the cross of diaphragm. We can also see the contrast filled stomach. And identifying this diaphragm cross is important. Identifying these uh, azygous veins are also important because they will form the basis for the uh, the, the retrocural nodes. Now, how do we identify the azygous and hemiazygous vein? So we have to identify the, the abdominal aorta, which is very easy to identify. Is the largest and almost uh, almost a circular structure on cross section lying in front of the vertebral body. Contrast field when we give uh, when we give IV contrast. This is very easy to identify, and then we have to go back a little bit posterior and lateral. In front of the vertebral body, we can appreciate the zygous vein. Now behind this, so this place would be the area for uh, retrocrural nodes. Okay. Now we can also see the cross of diaphragm here, and the retrocrural nodes will be medial to the cross of the diaphragm. Now, uh, as I was saying, that the azygous vein is basically a venous system which connects the superior, which connects the superior and inferior vena cava system and uh, the hemiazygous vein is uh, draining that also drains in the azygous vein and basically both of these azygous and hemiazygous veins are formed by the union of the right subcostal so the subcostal and ascending lumbar venous system so the right side will form the azygous vein and the left side will form the hemiazygous vein now uh, when we go a little bit down we are at the level of g junction now the gastroesophageal junction and we can appreciate the gastroesophageal junction here. We can appreciate the liver. We have to identify the fissure for ligamentum venosum, which is not very easy all the times. And this is uh, between the uh, left lobe and uh, uh, the the quadrant the quadrant lobe. So it will be uh, difficult sometimes. But if you can identify this, that is that is a good thing because at this level we will find the G junction. So. The level where we find this fissure for ligamentum venosum at the same level we will be able to appreciate the G junction. However, uh, most of the time what I believe is actually it's always better to identify structure as it is and if we can identify this G junction by looking at this even if we are unable to identify this uh, landmark there should not be any problem. So here we can also see the gastrohepatic ligament so at the same level we can see this and we can also appreciate the diaphragmatic cross here. We can see the stomach here. Now going a little bit lower down again. We are now at the level of portal vein bifurcation. And at this level, when the portal vein is bifurcating, we can appreciate the inferior vena cava is almost within the substance of liver. We can see the uh, abdominal aorta in front of the vertebral body. And here, we can see two vascular structures, one little bit wider and one little bit thinner. The wider one lying anterior and uh, more, later, more lateral and anterior to the thinner one. So this is the splenic vein and this is the splenic artery. And we can see here the gastrohepatic ligament, but I, I think we can ignore that. Now, the splenic artery is actually seen lateral to the left cross. So we can see the cross of the diaphragm. 
it will be lateral to that. You can see the splenic artery here, and it will remain uh, posterior. The splenic artery is superior. So when we'll see uh, a slice by slice images, the splenic artery will be appreciated in a more cranial section than the splenic vein. And here we can also see the h shaped portal vein bifurcation. So if we see that the limbs, the, the portal vein is bifurcating into left and right, and the left will again divide into right and left. So this is the left portal vein will be divided into the right and left, and the right one will be divided into anterior and posterior. And again, they will uh, further subdivide. We can also see the diaphragmatic crust here. Now, again, we are going a little bit uh, to the uh, caudal sections. Now, we can see here we are at the level of the fissure for ligamentum teres, the left and uh, right lobes of liver. We can appreciate the porta hepatis here. And we can also see the inferior vena cava, which is a little bit anterior to the caudate lobe. And <clears throat> we can appreciate the aorta over here. We can also see the cross of diaphragm. Little bit anterior to this aorta, we can see a small circular structure, which is the celiac trunk. Now, we can also see here the hepatic artery. Now, basically, when we want to identify these hepatic artery, celiac trunk, we have to do it in a very systematic manner. Sometimes looking at this one section may not be adequate. So it has to be slice by slice identification of the structures and the celiac trunk will be the first anterior branch coming out from the aorta in the abdomen. The first anterior branch of the abdominal aorta is the celiac trunk. And we will gradually see how the celiac trunk bifurcates. So now we are at the level of uh, again we are at the level of fissure for ligamentum teres, but in a little bit caudal section. You can see the IVC here. You can also see the aorta here, and this potential space in between the IVC and the aorta is the area or space for the aorta cable lymph node. And we can also see here the celiac trunk very clearly, and we can see that the celiac trunk is dividing. Now, the origin and bifurcation of celiac trunk, we can see here as a T-shaped structure. So this is the T, the, the, the main limb is formed by the celiac trunk, the left limb is formed by the splenic artery and the right limb is formed by the uh, hepatic artery. Now, the hepatic artery, you can see in the red color, the splenic in the blue color and the celiac in the green color. So, we can see another circular structure here, which is the splenic vein, which lies posterior to the pancreas at this level. And this area behind, uh, the, around the abdominal aorta, on the left side, that will be the area for para-aortic lymph node. Now, the why it is important to understand because we know that the contouring guidelines for pancreatic or uh, cervical cancers are a bit different for para-aortic lymph nodes. The, when we contour the parotid lymph nodes as per the RTOG guidelines, we basically take 1 cm, 2 cm and 3 cm, left, anterior, right and uh, 2 to 5 mm posteriorly or till the anterior vertebral body. So that is as per the RTOG guidelines. However, when we contour as per the uh, cervical cancer parotid nodal guidelines, that is a little bit different. So when we contour the lymph nodal status for uh, pancreatic biliary structures, we contour the celiac artery, we contour, uh, we take additional one centimeter around the arteries, we contour the superior mesenteric vein, we contour the portal vein, we contour the superior mesenteric artery. So identifying these structures are basically important for that reason. Now, that is how the celiac artery divides. So it gives three main branches, the left gastric, the splenic, and the common hepatic. Now the common hepatic again divides into the hepatic artery proper, it divides into the gastroduodenal and it also gives a tweak of right gastric artery. Now when we continue this proper hepatic, hepatic artery proper, it gives a cystic branch which is the first branch of that 
and then it divides into right and left branch and uh, gradually they become uh, the sinusoidal arteries and the sinusoidal arteries and vein again they form the gradually from the left and right hepatic vein the the the, the, the uh, and then gradually they drain into the inferior vena cava so again going little bit caudally we are now at the level of upper pole of both kidneys here we can again appreciate that the ifc is lying on the little bit anterior to the kidney and lateral to the aorta lateral to the midline and in between this aorta and vena cava there will be the aortic cava lymph nodes this little bit oval shaped structure sometimes this can be a, a confusion between uh, whether it's a lymph node or not but sometimes the diaphragmatic crust that can be thickened and can look like this so if there is a confusion and we have to scroll up and down to see what structure is this here we can also appreciate the gallbladder we can also appreciate the pylorus but that will be the part of other discussion the right kidney and left kidney now here if we look at the aorta we can also see an a uh, horizontal contrast field structure you can see this is marked in yellow color so that is basically the <coughs> left renal vein which originates from the uh, which comes out of the uh, left kidney it crosses the midline goes to the opposite side to drain into the uh, <coughs> Uh, right drain uh, the inferior vena cava so and again you can see another circular dot in front of this left renal vein so which is marked in red color you can again see this so the horizontal contrast field structure that is the left renal vein and the next structure i am going to show you this is the superior mesenteric artery now the superior mesenteric artery that may not be always at the same level so it will be the second anterior branch of the abdominal aorta and that can be appreciated from other sections if we can see the uh, sagittal or uh, sagittal section that will be much more clear now just look at this green color there's a larger structure lying on the right side of the superior mesenteric artery that's the superior mesenteric vein the superior mesenteric artery on right of that this is the superior mesenteric vein and we can also appreciate part of the splenic vein here so the importance of identifying this this is the point uh, the or, or at the level where the superior mesenteric vein and splenic vein unites together that forms the portal vein so at this level the portal vein will be formed now i am going back a little bit to show the previous sections they will gradually go up and they will form the portal vein again the portal vein will be divided into left and right so the portal vein forms at a much lower level you can see <clears throat> the gradually goes up and enters the liver then again divides into left and right branches so <clears throat> i think we are very clear here now going little bit lower down now we are at the level of the renal hilum so we can appreciate the renal hilum and a uh, lot of other structures so this is the hepatic flexor of colon this is the transverse colon now we can see the superior mesent sorry we can see the superior mesenteric vein we can also see the superior mesenteric artery we can see the left renal vein we can see the aorta so as i said aorta and the contrast field horizontal structure crossing from left side to right side that is the renal, left renal vein a uh, circular dot like structure in front of that that will be the superior mesenteric artery and the largest a uh, larger contrast field structure on right of this superior mesenteric artery would be the superior mesenteric vein and we can also appreciate the second part of duodenum which is one of the very important organ at risk in upper abdominal uh, uh, radiation so we need to identify the first part of duodenum second part third part and we can uh, and then we will be able to conclude the entire duodenum as a as a, as a complete way but contouring duodenum is a completely altogether different a different thing and it will itself take a, a, almost a complete class so <clears throat> so i just let me show you the region for aorta cava lymph node so again you can see the aorta and we can see the ivc and this will be the place where the aorta cava lymph node should be lying down, lying down. and the uh, left side a uh, little bit away from the aortic 
order that will be the area for priority leaf node. Now we are at the caudal level of renal hilum, renal hilum and we can again see here the abdominal aorta and anterior to abdominal aorta a flattened contrast field structure again can be visible. So that will be the left renal vein that can be seen and in this yellow color what I am showing is basically the horizontal part or, uh, or third part of duodenum and sorry. <coughs> So we can appreciate the aorta, we can appreciate uh, the IVC and now going to the next slice, we are almost at the level of aortic bifurcation now. So the abdominal aorta will now bifurcate into two common uh, arteries, the left and right and we will also be able to see the formation of inferior vena cava and at this level it, we can also appreciate the left and right common iliac veins uniting together to form the inferior vena cava. Now we are going again little bit down. So we, are, we can now see the common internal iliac artery and we can also see the com common internal iliac vein which is little bit posterior and lateral to the artery. We can also appreciate a thick large circular structure which is the psoas muscle. We can see the vertebral body Identifying this space is important because when you contour the iliac group of lymph nodes, so we give a 7 mm margin around these vessels and also we include this potential space. So that form I will show you why. Now you can see that there are three different groups of iliac lymph nodes, the lateral group, the medial group and the intermediate group. So the lateral group is lateral to the common iliac artery and medial to the psoas which is marked in the yellow color. So we can see the artery here which is more anterior compared to the vein, the, the lateral, the lateral uh, part would be the, uh, the lateral group. The medial to this and lateral to the vertebra would be the medial group and posterior lateral part will be the intermediate group. So if we contour the entire thing, this will be the entire iliac group of lymph nodes. Now again going down, we can see the internal iliac groups uh, or internal iliac vessels now. So the this will be supplying all the pelvic uh, viscera and the muscles. So we can appreciate these small arteries which are basically internal iliac artery branches. We can also see the external iliac artery and the external iliac brain, vein. And these in, internal iliac arteries, they have a lot of branches. So we can you can uh, remember, try to remember this mnemonic. I love going places in my own way, in my very own underwear. And they form all these different arteries. However, as of now, we really do not need to identify these individual arterial branches for our contouring purposes. Now, when they divide this and this external and internal iliac artery, when they divide, you can imagine that there will be a potential space between the between that uh, two artery, uh, artery divisions. So the cranial most part of that would be the uh, hypogastric node and it will be the level immediately after the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. Now going a little bit lower down, we can again see the external iliac artery, we can see the vein and these are all the internal iliac branches. Again it will have three different groups, the lateral group, the medial group and the intermediate group and again we give margin around this to form the external iliac lymph node group, the internal iliac lymph node group and when we contour the obturator lymph node we basically connect with a 18 millimeter brush in between this. And now we are almost at the lower end or we are almost at the end of the pelvis. Here we can now appreciate the inguinal node, we can see the inguinal ligament. So this is the appearance of femoral head or the uh, roof of acetabulum and that would end the contouring of the pelvic lymph node groups. Uh, so the external will end here, I'm sorry. So the external group, uh, so that will be the end of the external iliac group and it will continue as the femoral group or inguinal lymph node. The, so external iliac artery will cross the inguinal ligament and it will continue as the femoral artery. Now, 
uh, I am almost at the end of my talk. So it's important to identify the vessels because in many many cases they will be the basic first basic step to contour the lymph nodes. And now we are doing more of a conformal planning contour based planning where missing the lymph nodes can be dangerous in terms of a disease outcome. However, the vascular anatomy is never fixed. It may be variable. The surgeons, a lot of time when they operate, they see they see a lot of anomaly ab aberration from the normal anatomy. So it's not a fixed thing. It's highly variable, and we have to adapt ourselves as per the variation. The important thing is that the tumor also changes the vascular anatomy. If there is a large tumor infiltrating a vein or artery, that can change the anatomy of the vessel altogether. If we know how to treat a pancreas with SBRT, then you might remember that the tumor and vessel interface we have to identify where we want to give a little bit higher dose. So identifying those areas, how to identify encasement of the vessel, how to identify whether it's just an abutment or encasement. So these things gradually will become more important when we will uh, embark on this uh, target this target volume delineation and I, I I really appreciate the way this target volume delineation series was conducted. All these speakers they have uh, so nicely explained the anatomical detail of the target volumes based on all these factors: how to identify muscles, how to identify vessels, bones, everything that was really commendable. So gradually uh, you will learn that it depends a lot uh, mostly on your experience on your practice. So it is very important that you sit in front of your system, take help from your seniors, and definitely take help from the radiologists because that is uh, they are the actual person to teach us the vascular anatomy. After you learn from them for a long time, then gradually you will have the confidence, and then you can modify the contouring as per your need. It might be a high time that we now incorporate radiology as part of our curriculum. So uh, now I, I thank once again Dr. Gunasilan sir and the entire organizing team of JIGMAR for giving me this uh, opportunity and inviting me to give this talk. I am really thankful to Dr. Manisha Jana, additional professor in the Department of Radi uh, Radio, Diagnosis, Radio Diagnosis at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. Uh, she has helped me a lot in preparation of these slides and understanding the vessels. I am really thankful to Tata Memorial Hospital and uh, where I did part of my residency as a senior resident and I learned a lot of things from all of my teachers over there. All my patients, all my students who have always uh, given me an opportunity to treat them and to teach them and that is how we always become more refined and rectify our errors. And again, once again, I am thanking the organizers and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir. Maybe I can take a few. Okay, sir. Uh, we'll limit to the questions that have been asked uh, by students in this session. Uh, sir, in context of cardiac anatomy, uh, do we delineate and give differential constraints to the different parts such as pericardium, uh, left uh, anterior descending coronary artery, or do we con consider the heart as a whole? So, as of now, there is no consensus on the dose constraints for the individual uh, chambers or the individual parts. As of now, we give con constraint for uh, the entire heart. There are some, some series where they use some kind of uh, dose constraints for the left anterior descending artery. However, as of now, the major practice is to give constraint as a whole for the heart. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, two queries in regards to landmarks of parotid lymph nodes. Uh, one candidate wanted to uh, repeat the explanation if time permits, and another candidate has asked uh, why do we take different landmarks for uh, upper border of uh, parotid lymph nodes? In some cases, T12, uh, T12, L1, whereas in some other contouring guidelines, L1, L2. <laughs> You know, these all these guidelines, the borders, everything actually comes from the pattern of recurrence data. So we are evolving in our information. We are having more information. And uh, regarding these guidelines, I always say that these are always there to guide you. 
Now, every institute has their own protocol based on their own uh, uh, own pattern of recurrence data, their outcome. So it will not be uh, too much justified to say that this one is absolutely correct and the other one is absolutely wrong. So it's like a kind of dynamic thing and that has to be decided by an institute what level, what border they would use for the uh, guide uh, for the treatment. So recently, the upper border, so earlier time when I was a resident, I used to learn that as it might be D10, D11 or D11, D12. Now, mostly we know it's a D11, D12, what is being followed. So there are a lot of ambiguity and I, I, I think it would be unjustified to, to give any, any specific single uh, border as a upper border of priority. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, on the same vein, uh, in cervix versus rectum, we define uh, presacral differently. We define abdominal presacral, pelvic presacral in rectum. Uh, obturator groups we define. Uh, so the question is, uh, what would be the upper and lower borders of presacral and upper, uh, obturator group of limb nodes during contouring generically? Or do we go by site-specific guidelines? So, uh, as a whole, as I said, that the level of bifurcation of the common iliac group. The common iliac will divide into external and internal and that would be the uppermost part of the obturator or hypogastric group. Regarding this presacral, if the if you are treating CS cervix, then it's mostly S1 to S3 what we can do. But in case of rectum, when you treat the presacral space, it comes down till the tip of the coccyx. So definitely it is depending it depends on the primary also now again there are a lot of controversies regarding exclusion of the lower part of the presacral node so what if the uh, if the cardinal ligaments are involved so then the entire presacral space has to be included so that way is it's always have to you have to modify your contour based on what is the clinical scenario what is the disease what is the stage what is the structure involved so it has to be dynamic. So now when you decide that, okay, I have to treat the, I, I, I am able to, or I am comfortable in treating the S1 to S3 only. So you just come to till the S3. But if your clinical situation demands treating the entire presectoral space, then you have to go till the deep coccyx. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. In the context of, uh, since we are learning about vessel anatomy, uh, what contrast phase do you use and what are the timings? Do you use arterial phase contrast or uh, venous or a portal phase during your CT simulation? So, uh, see, other than this uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, mostly, so there we use triphasic scan for a specific reason. Otherwise, it's always in the arterial phase what we, we take because the, the reason of giving contrast is most of the time to have better target delineation for the primary tumor also. Uh, most of the tumor they enhance more with the arterial phase. So the scans are mostly acquired on the arterial phase. Uh, until and unless it's a hepatocellular carcinoma, we have to go for a triphasic scan. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, now another thing is when you were when you were doing uh, pl uh, planning scan for brain tumors. So for brain tumor the thing is completely different. There because of the a rigid blood brain barrier, the contrast does not reach the in brain parenchyma so fast. So, there the protocol is you have to wait for almost 7 to 10 minutes after giving the contrast. The reason is after waiting for 7 to 10 minutes, the contrast enters the parenchyma, concentrates within the tumor, and then you are able to see the tumor in a much better way. So that is why I, I said that it all depends on the kind of clinical scenario you are dealing with that time, the primary tumor indication, what are the structures you need to contour. If it is a brain tumor, I will definitely not do any arterial venous or anything. So I have to wait till eight or 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, an interesting anatomic question. We learned that lymph nodes are associated, with, lymph nodes and lymphatics are associated with venous anatomy. Then why do we consider boundaries of lymph nodal spaces with respect to arterial anatomy? No, it's, see, it's like the space. So typically, the lymph nodes always, are almost always, they are situated around the vessels. It's not only about artery. 
If you see uh, everywhere it has been written as vessel. Now vessel has two components, one arterial component and one venous component. So when you contour the vessel, is it has to be including the artery and vein. Okay. Now it all depends on the location of the lymph nodes. So if you are treating a abdominal an abdominal tumor, like you are dealing with a pancreatic tumor. And then you have to know the location of the lymph nodes. So the surgically, the, the pattern of recurrence data, the surgical anatomy, they say this is the location is mostly within one centimeter of the uh, artery. And that is the major area where failure happens. That is why this concept of taking margin has come around the artery in case of abdominal tumors. Now, if you see the guideline for the para group, so depending on whether it is a primary uh, primary GI or primary cervix, now we contour the paraortic, we contour the aortocaval, and we also contour the paracaval group of lymph nodes. So it's a it's a margin around the aorta, it's a margin around the vena cava, and also the space in between aorta and vena cava. So as I was saying that when you follow the RTOG guideline for a paraortic nodal contouring for uh, pancreatic tumors. So, if you see that guideline, actually, uh, that that guideline actually came for uh, uh, pancreatic tumors. So, there you give one, two, and three centimeter uh, margin. That that's almost uh, most of the time that's sufficient to include ninety five percent of the lymph nodes. So, that is also a statistical probability that how many or how what is the percentage that you can miss. So if you give that one to three centimeter margin, you are almost certain that 90 to 95 percent of the lymph nodes should be adequately covered. Now, when you see, when you read the article by Berio et al., it, you will find that the uh, the pattern of failure for cervical cancer is different. That one to three centimeter is not uh, justified for a cervical tumor because the the pattern of failure data shows that failures are happening in between the swas muscle as I was showing you the intermediate group of lymph nodes, so in between the vertebra and the swas muscle. So it's important then to include that space also. Right. So it all depends on what kind of tumor you are treating and what is the pattern of failure. So for gynecological tumors, the pattern of failure is not comparable with the pattern of failure for a GI tumor. That is why the guidelines are also different. So if you see the guideline, the burial at all, they say that the anterior boundary is 0.7 centimeter. That should be sufficient. So you do not need a 2 centimeter anterior margin around aorta or vena cava when you are treating a cervical cancer. Again, 1 centimeter on left side is not adequate for cervical cancer. Then you have to go till the psoas. So that is how the contouring is, is different. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, one quiz question that was asked yesterday, which candidates are a bit doubtful. What, uh, according to ESTRO guidelines for breast contouring, what have they defined as level four axilla, and what are its boundaries during contouring? Uh, I must, I must say sorry that I really do not follow ESTRO guidelines. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, this I think I, is answer from the quiz itself. Uh, level four axilla they have defined just as the SCF node. So what we do, traditionally do as SCF is defined as level four in estro. There is nothing different. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are some difference in the estro guideline. As because I really do not follow estro guidelines, so I am uh, uh, really unable to answer this question. I am really sorry for that. But I think there are some subtle differences between traditional way of controlling supraclav and the estro way of controlling level four. Like in uh, when we contour as per this traditional uh, this uh, RTOG or the the uh, head neck guidelines, we include the internal iliac and also include the uh, uh, the space around that in between thyroid, in between uh, internal carotid artery, and uh, in between the uh, in between the the sclerotic group of muscles. But this is true group i think they just include the medial border of the internal jugular vein or something like that so that reduces your target volume to some extent and subsequently you see less of esophagitis thank you sir uh, sir one question can you show brachial plexus i think uh, that would be more appropriate for mri slides sir uh, 
Uh, I can actually show brachial plexus on CT as well, but I do not have the representative CT right now with me. If you want to know that, I can take a different class on some other time on how to contour the brachial plexus on CT. You can actually identify the brachial plexus on the CT. It's possible. So definitely we need MRI, but to, as because we plan on CT, it's important to identify on CT as well. But if you do not have a do not have an MRI, then also it is possible to contour the brachial plexus. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, how so contouring brachial plexus. So contouring brachial plexus itself is almost one hour class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Doctor uh, Mandal. I think uh, you have uh, uh, you have taken an excellent uh, class. As you said, you are already uh, have to join for a program so <laughs> it, it was a very elaborative and uh, excellent section once again